tell me if you can't see my head. Sorry. If my head's there, we can be good to go. You can see my head? Great. Okay, so a very important announcement, which is kind of a sad announcement. Really watch your bags. One of our MA students just put his bag down in the political science like plant lounge, whatever you call it, for five minutes and somebody stole it. So I don't know, I think there's lots of theft going on at the beginning of the year, so just a heads up, like, because he has his computer and his iPad all that so just uh, be mindful and I'm one of the worst people for like not being mindful so I think the I think the first little while is the worst and then the people that are here for is the worst getting products leave and the rest of us are around um I have and, and the staff have tried endlessly to get us another room and it's not going to happen so we're just going to have to make you know the best of this room and I again I'm really sorry for that because I know it's really hard to get I sat in one of those chairs after you guys left right I was like I'm going to check out those desks and see yeah like that was that was went back to my undergrad um so I know it's really hard if you've got a computer you seem to be doing okay though so you can be Oh yeah, you guys are doing okay on your computers. Well, good on you, because I tried mine on my own. That's difficult. Um, hi. So anyway, we're here. I mean, I'll try again at halftime. I tried that, and we'll see what we can do. But hey, fortunately, you guys are awesome. I'm pretty good, and the room sucks. It could be worse. Um, for people that haven't got their presentation pick, see me at break time, and we'll do that. We got four people presenting today, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll go for about an hour and 15, an hour and 20. We'll do a break, maybe a little bit longer break this time, so like the people that, how many people haven't got their presentation? Everybody here has got their presentation pick? Just one person, two people, three. Okay, that's not bad. So we'll do those at break time. Okay, um, I think the other thing I need to tell you is the readings are in the bookstore, library, and most of them are as PDFs. So it's kind of up to you how you want to sort yourself out. Is there a clothes or something? Yeah, there's a room in the hallway for the clothing. Seriously. Um, yeah. So it's, it's up to you how you want to sort yourself out of which ones you want to buy or use in the library. Uh, which ones you want to look at in PDF. But I tried to make everything available so you didn't have to buy. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, of course, keeping with the copyright laws, as York seems to have set them out, it changes all the time. Um, okay, let's start. I like to start with this text for a few reasons. One, it's one of my favorite texts actually. Partly for what it's saying, and the interesting thing about the text is you can't really tell who Rancy, who's, whether it's Rancière writing it, quoting Jacato, or it's Jacato. They kind of slid together. It's quite a political text. It came out in the 80s in France when there's a real debate over education and teaching and how people weren't passing, weren't passing their qualifying exams, etc. Right, so. It was a political intervention. What Grancier does is he does political interventions but doesn't directly mention it, which is kind of interesting. And we just check and see if it's taping. Can you see it taping? Like, is it going away? Awesome, thank you. Um, so we can use this, I think, because, I mean, you guys are in third year, so in first year, you're more familiar with the fact of how high school is structured unless you were really fortunate to go to a cool high school where you weren't explained to all the time, right? Now I'm gonna lecture, I'm not gonna explain. Um, partly because I really think that in any of the texts we're doing, you know, I've obviously read them a few times, most of them, there's some new ones on there. So the problem with reading stuff a few times is you tend to reproduce what you read before, right? Like, so I, I really think it's possible for people particularly third year people, um, to have, I'm just keeping this for time, to have different and more interesting readings of the text that I've read. 
Because I really notice, even if you do it, because I did a, I looked at a clean copy on my iPad, and I noticed that I compared it, I noticed I tend to underline the same things. So that's just a function of, like, when you read something, what's going to stick out to you probably is what stuck out before. Maybe not. Sometimes you get new stuff. Anyway, so you guys will get different things, and that's, and that's really great for me. Ranzier is uh, still a living writer. He's a very well-known um, critic and proponent of democracy. If you're interested in Ranzier's work, I teach it at the graduate level, so does Martin Bria. Um, he was born in 1940, so I don't know, that makes him old. Um, but he is still writing and still doing public lectures, etc. So what we're looking at is his five lessons in intellectual emancipation, the ignorant schoolmaster. Now, Rancière is a contemporary French thinker. He comes out of the tradition of modern political thought. So it's really easy to spot people, like to spot, to spot the thought or the thinking of Marx, of Kant, of Nietzsche, of Hegel, of Heidegger in his work, which is one of the reasons I wanted to start with Rance here, because he's an updated version of it. And he really does history as political theory, so he incorporates it too, and he does it very, very well. So what he's doing in this book, and he has endless books, I mean, I don't even know how many. I think for the next lecture, I might have a number of his book covers on a slide. So what he says, um, he says is my book tells the history of a professor, Joseph Jacoteau, who created a scandal in Holland and France in the 1830s because when the Bourbon monarchy came back in for the restoration, he had to exit France because he was a supporter of the Republic of Napoleon. Um, um, so he had to exit. So he had to exit and he was given sort of a place to teach in Louvain in France. So he created a scandal in Holland in France of the 1830s, and he died in 1840, by proclaiming that uneducated people could learn on their own without a master to explain things to them. That's not such a novel concept for us now, I think, particularly when you see people like, I think, and I want your input on this, but I think political theory is being done quite differently. I think it's being done on blogs. I think that you've got access to a whole bunch of more diverse um, material than you do in a classroom. I think that, you know, once you see in, in terms of IT and stuff, uh, people have taught themselves, they've taught themselves gaming. So in that sense, in fact, some of the, the, the major game makers um, really taught themselves. You, you didn't study it, right? So in that sense, I think that we, I wouldn't call them uneducated, but non-specialized. Non-specialized people could learn on their own without a master to explain things to them. And that masters on their side can teach things they themselves don't know. And we can talk about that, because I do believe you can teach things you don't know, providing the, per and I, I do believe that because I've done lots of reading courses on being in time with graduate students, and they always, they end up teaching me, right? Because they always tend to, they go on to publish on being in time as well, right? And I swear, you know, I mean, I don't know, it's like a, I, I get it, but it's not like one of my best, but they, they really get it. And I've also really noticed, particularly at the graduate level, if people are made responsible for teaching you, they're gonna know a lot more. So I think also one of the things that in terms of, of what Rance, just gonna say in particular, in terms of what Rancière using Jacato says is that a lot of education is really set up to keep people knowing lesser than you. Okay, that's really a problem. Because I and it's a problem because okay, I know certain things. Okay, because I don't but there's a whole series of things I don't know that you're gonna know better than me and that you're going to bring to whatever you're doing better than me. So I think, I think that old motto of having somebody explain something to you um, doesn't really work when you've got a student body that knows a lot. And also they can go and listen to Zizak do a lecture on something or somebody else do a lecture on something. 
So in that sense, I think that one now does teach what they don't know to people that want to learn it. Okay? So it's kind of like giving people the space to learn something. You know, now it works in a lot of areas. I was gonna say, maybe it doesn't work in swimming, because I had two swimming teachers, a kindergarten swimming teacher and then a triathlete swimming teacher. I didn't learn to swim until I was old, right? Because I was terrified. So, but now I swim all the time. And I'm in the medium lane, which is not that. Uh, I'm a slow medium, so, but I mean, you know, I'm good. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, I never seem to be able to figure out that skill myself. One of the grad students was in talking to me yesterday and he taught himself how to swim. So I'm like, yeah, you know, and now when you look at, I mean, the thing now that's really interesting is when you look online, like they've broken down, so looking at swimming, uh, swimming YouTubes uh, with instructors, they've broken down like every move, right? So you really can teach yourself to do way more now than you could in the past because the information is there. Or one of my colleagues that re um, got it in, we call it like rebuilt his house looking at YouTube videos. You know, so I mean, we really have the tools to kind of teach ourselves. And the material is sort of there, which is also why I think, I think this works really well. So Jacato then is a, I don't know, um, he's also a, a very interesting dresser. I have to say. That's a picture of him, a drawing of Jacato. So he's a 19th century French literature teacher. And he ends up being exiled to the Netherlands. Um, he doesn't understand Flemish, and he doesn't seem to be in too big a hurry to learn it. And he finds himself in a situation where he's teaching an exile in the Netherlands. He, he's French, right? And he's in a situation where a good number of his students don't speak French, and he doesn't speak Flemish. So he decides he's going to do what he can to teach the students. So I don't know, how many, I mean, you don't have to put your hands up, but are you guys, are people in the classroom instructors in things? I do teach stuff. Yeah. Um, I tutor, um, and I actually do tutor French as well. Oh, awesome, okay. Nice. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I tutor math and English to uh, middle schoolers. So what's middle school? Like grade 9 to 11? Um, no, like 6. Like grade 6. Yeah. Grade 6 uh, to 6, 7, 8 is middle school? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, that's really nice. Any other instructors? Yeah. I used to be a, an educational assistant at a uh, college. Nice. So I helped students in various subjects. So one was in a farming program. One was in that's actually kind of program. awesome. It was cool, yeah. Nice experience, but yeah, I had to like help them with homework and kind of learn the material myself while also helping them. Yeah, that's great. What about? I think you had your hand up too. Uh, I teach Muay Thai, so it's kind of like a. Uh, <laughs> seriously? Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> right on. Uh, right on. I saw a hand here. Did you have your hand up? Somebody else had their hand up over here. I thought. Anybody else teach? Because I mean, one of the things did you have up right now? Yes. Yeah. I used to teach uh, middle schoolers um, in the co-op program nice. in high school. And right now I'm part of the peer mentor program. Nice. That's good. Yeah, I mean, um, I've taught a number of years. I, I also teach general semantics and economic and photography. Um, but I've also taken a lot of courses. I've taken a lot of language courses that I'm pretty terrible at. Looking at you, it's just interesting. I'm just like, hey, no, seriously, I have taken Spanish, French, German, Hebrew. Uh, I think that's it. And I'm good while I'm taking it. Um, if you get me on that day, I can have a conversation with the camp. So, which is it? Um, so, I also, one of the things I learned that comes up in this, hey, just a minute. That's not me. Yes? No. 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 What's your first name? I was close. Yeah. I was like, I know, see, I knew who you were, so Hamza. Yeah. I just mispronounced it, I apologize. It's okay. Oh. It's okay. 
I did not wipe them. No, I'm not so good at that. I'm mostly more dyslexic on the pronunciation. So, yeah, thumbs up. Okay, so I mean, one of the things I found when I took, when I've taken Anna's classes on various things, and it's, it, and it's where Ramsey or is going with this. I'm just going to close the door again. Where he's going to go with this, which is great, actually, is that I, and you've probably found this, like I don't know, are people studying for the LSAT? Because I have a lot of people at various stages of Yes, everyone, okay. It, it is really difficult because it's a completely different thinking model. And then it's hard to crack, and then you crack it. Then you go to law school and you're like, all that study for the LSAT doesn't relate to what I'm studying, right? <laughs> but I'm in, so that's great. So yeah, good luck. I mean, really seriously, good luck on that. It's a, it's a, it's hard work. Um, it's hard work for your brain. But one of the things I've always found is if I actually am going to learn something, um, it really has to do with the attention that's put on it. So that's where this kind of ends at, at lesson three. Now, one of the things I've also found, I've had to go teach stuff because the co-teacher couldn't go. This was general semantics in India. Um, and I really found that, and it was great, it was at a, a technology university, students were awesome. But I really found that having to teach something, you really learn it. Okay, so there you are, you're like, I have to go teach this to 35 people. And then all of a sudden, your attention just like focuses and you're right on it. So that's pretty, that, or for people that are doing um, tutoring. You know, you don't think much about it, then you've got to help somebody with it, all of a sudden your attention is right on it, and you kind of learn. And then I thought, I mean, obviously I, this book's been around for a while, and then I thought, well, that's interesting. That's kind of what Ramsey is talking about, in the sense that we tend to, when we need to, we tend to put an incredible amount of attention, of will on something. So LSAT, LSAT gets a lot of attention of will, because you have, did you have time? Okay. Um, so anyway, Jacato, that so as I said before for the people that just came in, Ramsier and Jacato, it's difficult to tell who's whether it's Ramsier or Jacato's ideas, because Ramsier blends them, right? Um Jacato, 1770 to 1840, a French um, professor who's exiled to the Netherlands because of the restoration, and he has to teach in a language he doesn't speak which I think would be really interesting, actually. So he's a French teacher in France initially. He's an educational philosopher. He's creator of the method of intellectual emancipation. And then you get to the question. So he uses this text. So, you, so it's kind of interesting. It's like, how do you teach without a similar language? Like, how do you teach students when you don't have a similar language? Um, I don't know, does anybody teach English as a second language here at all? Or is anybody, because I was going to say one of the things, or has anybody taught somebody a second language not being able to speak the language they speak? Is that fine? Because I think that's really interesting because it's, it's how do you teach without having a similar language? Well, what what um, Jacato did was, was use the book Telemac and the French students learned the French text with the help of the Flemish translation, right? So, or sorry, I need to back up, I got those backwards. Flemish students learned the, learned the French text with the help of a Flemish translation. So if you take a look, say you're reading something in English and German. A good example is Heidegger, because Heidegger has his own Heidegger speak, right? Um, it, you'll start, I mean, when, when Ramsinger starts explaining how Jacato does it, you actually start, you take a look, and if you're taking a German class, one of the things you do, depending on where you're taking this, you start identifying words. Well, some of the easiest words to identify are political words. Um, in almost in any language, particularly in German for, for an English speaker. So you start circling them, so that's one of the ways that, that the, the students worked with the text was looking at like the first word and finding it again and again and pronouncing it, looking at the grammar and going through it, and it seemed to work. Now you say, okay, how well did it work? Well enough to, to really make Jacato 
very desirable as a teacher to teach lots of different things he didn't know how to do, which is kind of funny. So they, he found this text in common telematic, and the students learned the French text with the help of a Flemish translation. So I mean, you check it out, take a couple of different, now, okay, so if you're doing French, English, and German, that's a bit easier. Okay, but if you're doing Chinese, for example, and English, that becomes difficult because you really have to visually, symbolically think differently. And so you're going to be looking at the characters, for example. So then he does, he does what he can to teach the students. And what he observed is that, and this is the takeaway line in this part, right? He observed that the students left to themselves really did as well in their written work as the French students could have done which really changed how he thought about education. Because up to this point, he believed that, you know, according to the norm, you needed to have a teacher who knew more than you. And that teacher, and in those days, it was known as a master or a teacher, so it's like, um, that's why it's called the ignorant master. The important role of the teacher or master, he, this is the traditional understanding, is to transmit his knowledge to his students so they can bring them up to their level of knowledge, or his or her level of knowledge and expertise. Now there's trouble with that because then, you know, in first year you assume people know a certain amount, so you teach them a certain amount. In second year, I'm using university as an example, because Dr. Cho was teaching at university. In second year, you bring, you teach a bit more, and then third year, so you kind of build, build, build. But in many, in many cases, it's not just that you're building, you're actually containing and holding the, the person back, or the people back. And so the traditional way is that the, the teacher stays a bit ahead of the students, right? Um, and that they bring them up to different levels of expertise and knowledge. But what happens when some student sits down and reads Kant and gets it immediately and like moves on to the next and moves on to the next, which is quite possible. So Jacato then was really became critical of this view that the essential act of the teacher was to explicate, explain. And that there was a trajectory, a developmental trajectory from the most simple to the most complex. So the student's abilities acquired from just doing proved the dominant view incorrect. So basically, the students use the same language, in, the same text in two languages. And by using the same text in two languages, and try it for half an hour, um, French and Flemish, they learn spelling, conjugation, grammar, definition, how to put words together to make sentences. So what Jacato and the students experience led to a major revolution in pedagogy, a major revolution in education, and ultimately in the social order in terms of equality of people. The results then led Jacato to the observation that nobody knows anything other than what they have understood. That what we know, it's not enough to memorize something really, but but we have to be able to understand it. And a teacher doesn't necessarily make us understand it. What makes us understand something is when we're working with the text, putting attention on it. You know, for people that are doing their LSAT, at a certain point, your brain is going to crack the LSAT code, right? And then, there you are. Um, and come talk to me after you've written it. Tell me that. I, so and it, it's hard. The, the GREs are also hard because it's a different way of thinking, but you know necessary. So to explain something to someone is first of all to show them that they can't understand it by themselves. So I'm not explaining this to you. I'm just giving you, well, sort of my reading on the text, but your reading could be different, and you can say, hey, this just doesn't work, right? But to explain something to someone is, first of all, to show them that they can't understand it by themselves. And there's stultification. You know, there's, there's stultification whenever one intelligence is subordinated to another. Now look, if I was thinking back when I was learning self-defense, um, 
Like you need to have, it gets tricky because you need to have somebody who knows the skills, okay? Again, like languages, I was pretty good at it if I practiced every day, you know, because, so I mean, I was traveling on my own, I wanted to be set up so that if I got attacked, I could like, you know, know a couple of moves. And one of the great things was, and I, I took it on campus, went with, um, and one of the great things was we would practice with the person teaching it, like jumping out and attacking me, right? So just to try and teach your body, I mean, it didn't hurt me, obviously, but to try and teach your body to have a response before you think, which is kind of difficult to do. And I got to that point that you also have to keep it up. So in a sense, you need often, like in that case, you kind of do need people to teach you the skills. Okay, now I didn't go on to like, you know, keep doing any self-defense or anything, but, but I, did have, I did have a couple of skills. And one of the ones that really stuck with me, and you know, is like, because I'm often out on my own on the street, is kind of to know where people are positioned. Right, when you're, so you just get a sense, I mean, to have a real peripheral vision. Um, and so it's kind of no, and I, and I live in Chinatown, so there's always people on the street, so that's pretty easy. You know, like, it's one of the safest places to live because there's restaurants open all, you know, like that kind of stuff. Where it gets scary is if you're walking down the street and you don't see anybody. Like, that becomes scary. But just so, and then, you know, you become hyper alert to any movement because you, you've learned this skill of, you know, just kind of um, being aware of what, what's in your environment. So that carried over. So you don't, so in a sense, I understood that. Like you don't know anything other than what you've understood. When something's explained to you, there's a distance. Like there's a distance. So you know, like when you learn something, you're doing it. And New York, um, you know, really prides itself on experiential education. And I would have to say, I don't know what your experience is, but it's not up to par yet. Of course, it's have components of experiential education, but I think um, you really actually learn something as you're doing it. Yeah. So even, I mean, writing a paper is not exactly experiential education, but in writing a paper on something, it becomes much clearer than if you just are reading. So there's that sort of a doing. Now the explainer, the explicator, the teacher puts a distance between you and the material. So he, with Rancière, he calls the master and the explicator, he combines them, he calls them the master explicator, the master teacher who simply explains, and this is on page five. And he claims that the master's secret is to know how to recognize the distance between the taught material and the person being instructed. The distance between learning and understanding, and then he provides knowledge piece by piece. Which is okay, but it doesn't, it, it keeps the explicator in control. So then Ranciere says, using Jacopo, he says, if you take a look at language, and for those of you that have, you know, I don't know, little, little people around, either as brothers, sisters, children, you, or even little yourself, right? So you take a look at language and you realize that the first words the child learns are those that they learn on their own without somebody explaining it to them, right? You kind of learn, it's interesting, because you kind of learn best the language you're born into. And then you add to that. You learn best because you hear it around you. And you end up picking it up through repetition, you mimic, and then you understand. So what Jacoteau says is that the logic of, now we've moved, to, to also add, we've moved away, to some extent anyway, compared to what Jacoteau is talking about and what Rancière is talking about. We are particularly in social sciences and humanities, but we've moved away from there being an absolutely correct answer that's explained to you, right? So in that sense, there's always this, this opening for like thinking yourself. What his revelation is, is that the logic of the explicative system had to be overturned. Uh, LSATs, you guys are on your own there, there is a correct answer. You know, they don't seem correct, but there's definitely a correct answer. My uncles, are, are, did people that are writing LSATs, 
Did you take like elephant writing courses and practice practice? Is that what you did? Yeah. My uncle's often, they really wanted me to be a lawyer. So they, you know, offered to put me through an LSAT course. I think I did the one day and I was like, no, no, I'm not doing this, right? It's like, not that, you know, I mean, being a lawyer is actually pretty awesome, but the LSAT writing course, I was just like, oh, you know, so, so I never cracked the system. But now they have all these, all these uh, ways of cracking it, right? So what Francia Fujakuto suggests is that the slogan of the Enlightenment, understand, this is page 80, has caused a lot of trouble because it doesn't, it says, it, what you need to understand is you yourself needs to understand, not, you have, not you have, that you have to understand what somebody is, is teaching you. So basically the fact that was, was that Jagato's students had learned to speak and write in French without somebody explaining it to them. Now what's really interesting in terms of educational strategy, which is what Ramsey is interested in, is that the students had been given this permission to pass what Ramsey calls passing through a forest, whose openings and clearings the person who gave them permission had not discovered. That is, Jacato did not know when he gave the students permission for them to know. What he did, which I think is important, is leave his intelligence out of the equation. In fact, it was this absence of the master teacher's meddling intelligence that allowed the students to actually learn for themselves. So because Jacato left his intelligence out of the equation, this absence is the mediating intelligence of the master that replays the intelligence of past masters to the apprentices. That was left out. Yeah? What did the education do to the student? They were in university. OK, so they were in university. Um, and then they, he moved on to teach military stuff to a military college, like a, a post-secondary military college. Um, he moved on to teach painting. So fairly high level. Now that might, uh, were you suggesting, I, I can tell that you're saying, hey, maybe that works better at that level. Um, could be, I mean, definitely could be, because people have worked out the skills of how to learn anyway. However, one of the things that it goes back to is that, you know, I mean, it's 1830, so there's a lot of illiteracy. And illiteracy, even more so than now, um, translates into class. So there's a lot of illiteracy on the, on the part of poor people, and what Jagato was really trying to get across is that parents who could not read and write could teach their children to read. And I think that's really important for the time that he was for the time that he was doing it. Or, you know, I mean, do you? I, I mean, maybe you haven't yet, but you probably have. Yes, please move around if once he gets too uncomfortable, the next one is probably just as uncomfortable. Like yeah, no, I know, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure um, I'll also report that. I'm sure there's more than one seat broken here. No, and also if you get tired of sitting, if you want to get up and like walk around or something, please do, because I sat in those for about five minutes last week and I'm like, oh. um, So, do you remember, I don't know if, you've, if it's happened to you yet, if you've got kids and it's happening, do you remember the point where you realized that you kind of knew more than your parents? Oh, yeah, I know, it's always the case. It, I just can't hear you say. Isn't that like an illusion where I have to love you more than my parents or my body? I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I think partly when you say an illusion, yeah, in the sense that every, every generation goes through that, right? On the other hand, Given the knowledge sources now, and given the exponential increase in knowledge, it's quite possible that people now know more than any previous generation. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, what John Cato is trying to say is that even when you're in a situation where you know more than your parents, like you know how to read and write, this example he was using, and the parents don't, they can still work with you, you know? Or if you're working with somebody on math and you're not good at math, 
you can still work with them without knowing you know what they're learning so i think that's kind of radical because he's trying to say that the only difference that we're all born equal and the only difference then becomes like social construction right like what what you learn What they discovered, Jacato and his students discovered that sentences and all intelligences that produce them are of the same nature. So it's never understanding something, which the key is never more than translating. Like giving the equivalent of a text, but it's not necessarily reading. So, you know, do you remember the first paper called Text Judah? And um, do you remember, uh, mine was, uh, what do you call it, Dante's Inferno. No idea. Oh, I wanted to be a literature talk. This was like I was at work. Great times. Um, it was summer break. I was like, I'm going to be done to the Then I'm going to be all keyed up for the rest of my life. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so what I did learn, though, is because something, when it's difficult, you do kind of do the things that Rancy, Aaron, and Jack don't talk about. You take a look at the words. You see how they go together. You have to write them down because they reoccur again, right, and all that. And the... The inferno was like not so important in terms of content, but it was important in terms of working out how one reads and learns. So if you like, does anybody remember a, a text? Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so basically, you have to remind your hand that he was sort of like just a baby, sort of in the middle of this. <laughs> yeah, he was, however, he, his argument would be that to be a mediator or to open a space, you have to be intellectually emancipated with yourself. Because if you're not, you're always trying to kind of shove your ideas onto the person. Yeah, um, I was going to call you Paige, but what's your name? Madeline. Madeline, okay. Um, I, so, yeah, what Jack was saying to you, like, I guess we're here to start to smile, that's not so many questions, but um, I guess it's interesting to me that he's most so confident and stuff and like, being able to hold and like tell the students that we're capable of this and stuff. Like, isn't that incredibly radical to be a lead if there's that? And like, we have See the last part about isn't, isn't that, that like pretty radical and progressive for the times considering now? Like, we're trying to implement that kind of like care and attitude and we're all capable and we're all equal and stuff. But like, with the with the pairing of confidence, I find that like really modern in a way. Almost. Yes. And, like, surprising because it's like, yeah. This guy just went out there and did it. And also, like, it's interesting because he's like a French elite of the time. Like, he's the progressive of the yeah, yeah, I mean, so Napoleon was pro education, but he also saw it a lot of very traditional mindset. Yeah, he's very, he's yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. So I started, like, he was very, like, radical, or the character he's writing. It's also hard for me to tell how much he, like, Rancer himself is, like, these ideas were, like, absolute versus how much he's, like, kind of putting it out there to see what happens, because he's putting up this idea to be, like, what do you think is the wrong master to ourselves? And yeah. that's kind of where he comes around. So I thought that the aspect of confidence with that is, like, really modern and not something I expected. And that's great, actually, Mel, and that's, really, that's a really astute observation. And it's kind of the beginning of sort of individual bourgeois confidence, too, right? Yeah, yeah. the book's on the individual life, I used to be, that's what I'm saying. The book yeah. is on the individuals, I guess, what's so modern seeming about this movie. And then he talks, yeah, yeah, and then he talks about the community of individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's why there was such an emphasis on the, the individual will, almost. It's almost a necessity for him to pursue education based on your own will, almost. It seems that like the teacher's role shifts from like transferring knowledge, yep. I would say, yep. to somebody who's merely like a guide for your own will, like to achieve yeah. some of your own uh, de destiny. Like, a, like I don't know the word for it. I would say like, away from destiny. Your own path. path. That's good. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. 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 Because we're all masters on our own path, and yeah. we all need to interact and share ideas, and like that book is the connection. But also, when we share the ideas with that same book, that's a new connection. So that's great. That's great. That's like what Saeed says about traveling theory, right? Like you make yeah. a new connection and then the theory travels. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah, sorry, were you, you going to add to that? No, like, I, yeah, like it just seems that like the, the job of the teacher for him is like a completely different perspective. It's not to transfer knowledge, it's yeah. to allow knowledge to be discovered for whatever the student wills. Yeah, that's, hey, that would be nicely said. Um, and it's exactly what he said. And remember, Jack Hill's desperate because all of a sudden he is in the Netherlands having to teach, so he's got to come up with some way of doing this. So in a sense, it develops, you know, which I'm always fond of, it develops out of desperation, and something sort of really, sort of really good happens there. 
So as, as I said before, you've got initially this closed, I can say this, but it's built into that, there's this closed circle of knowledge where the Flemish students are speaking about Telemach, and they've only got the words of the text themselves, right? And then they would recount the sentences of Telemach to say what they thought of Telemach. So they're, they're speaking in this closed circle of knowledge, and then the question is, how does one get out of that? Well, one simply gets out of that by applying it to another text, right? So, or applying it like more generally. So you learn the skill and then you take it, you take it out to other sort of areas. So what's shown, and that both of you um, very eloquently said, is that a master <coughs> explicator isn't necessary. That, you know, and it's really radical at that point where, you know, and remember, you know, the church was the master explicator, and then from the church it moved to the, the um, professors and teachers, right? So the society was really built on master explicators. This whole idea that one can learn by oneself without a master explicator when one wants to is completely radical. And you're either motivated by desire, that you want to learn, or by a situation in which you have to, the constraint of the situation. Serantier then observes that Jacato's mastery, if you want to call it that, was really this simple order, command, that placed the students in a closed circle from which they could break out of in the closed circle of having to deal with this one book and in doing that, learning the French through dealing with the, with the book and learning uh, literature, French literature. And it wasn't even a particularly classic book. So what's interesting then is that Jacato transmitted nothing other than the method of learning, which was purely the students. So to go back, to what, what people were saying is he really didn't, he, he transmitted very little other than this method of learning, which wasn't his method of learning. It was actually the student's method of learning. It was purely the students. That's why he says, yeah. So he continued, what Jacato did was he continued to repeat the first occurrence then in a different situation. So first he did telemac. Then he began to teach two subjects that he was completely incompetent at, painting and the piano. So painting, I, painting in my estimation, would probably be easier to teach if you didn't know than the piano. But, you know, you just kind of open it up for people to pursue it, to use their own student method of learning. So they were flocking, students were flocking apparently, and this is documented, to Jacato in order to hear him say, I must teach you that I have nothing to teach you. Now remember, now you'd be kind of like, okay, that seems like, that seems a little hokey. Um, it's probably some sort of scam, right? And, you know, especially if you're paying, you're like, why am I paying you money to teach you something you don't know? Uh, but then, it's really important because there's this, it, at a time when everything was based on hierarchy and master explicators. So now you go, okay, I don't know, like I didn't necessarily, say you didn't necessarily like something and you wanted to learn more about it, you could just like go on and listen to a YouTube video and learn something about it, right? Or you can learn it yourself, whereas that option obviously wasn't there. So that if you have somebody who's in a position of authority saying, I'm going to teach you that I have nothing to teach you, that is completely radical at that time period. Now, the underside of that is you can teach what you don't know if the student is emancipated. Now, what does that mean? Kind of like they're willing to learn. And to emancipate someone, must, one must only be emancipated oneself which gets you to universal teaching. So Jacato's method of emancipated teaching, of emancipation, is universal teaching. It's based on four principles. The first principle, we kind of know this within 
Okay, we kind of, we can take that as a given. Um, I mean, obviously, some of us are going to be better at something else and all that, right? But that was earth-shaking because you're dealing with illiterate populations, right? And to say that all humans have equal intelligence, that we start off with equal intelligence, uh, and that's like, you know, I don't know how to say that so it works. That within, like within, unless there's something else, I was gonna say, unless you've got something, your intelligence may be, intelligence may be differently framed, but we basically all start off with equal intelligence. Every human, and if you ask yourself, like I don't know um, what your situation is, but you know, I'll just, I'll say this and then I'll go, I'll go to that, okay? So if I look back, like where I went to school and, and all of that, if you trace it through, you know, I have to say there are lots of people smarter than me that didn't end up as university props, right? That, that in a sense fell by the, the wayside. And then certainly they were as smart, had equal intelligence, if not more so. So it's not, so I really think the attention and will has, and maybe luck of the draw too, has something to play. But if you start off with the assumption that we all have equal intelligence, yeah. I may come over here because there's a hum up there and I was there. Yeah, tell the Ross that they're locked. Yeah, they, so like they, can all, like they all have the same capabilities. We do, and we lose it. Yeah, based on the circumstances. We lose it lots of different ways, like not having access to similar education, having, you know, having sort of abusive encounters when people tell you you're not smart. Like, there's a whole series of ways of losing that, that then, and it's self-perpetuating, or going to a high school where, you know, I don't know, like, high schools here, but I think so, but you get streamlined into different areas. So, you know, if you're the kids that got streamlined into, like, skills, um, you're probably not at university unless you sort of made the, the switch, right? So it's assumed, it's assumed very early on that people, and I think, once you assume that people have different intelligence, they get treated that way, which is really problematic. You know, because you, you know, you never know what, you never know what circumstances are going on that make someone appear as they, as if they aren't as intelligent as somebody else. Like you have no, you know, if you the other thing is, I don't know how many people here are working two or three jobs, but if you're working two or three jobs, you know, and, and you're kind of like a sleep in class, because there was a woman that took this class quite a while ago now, um, and she was like, look, if I fall asleep in class, it's not because you're boring. Okay, and I was like, okay, she's like, I finish a night shift at a bakery and come to class. And I was like, okay, interesting. She's an A student. But um, it's interesting that she told me that because you can, you know, when you, when you take, when you're lecturing or something, not, not so much me anymore because I know lots of things are always going on, but when you take as non-interest could be somebody just be exhausted from working one or two jobs and working in a night shift, right? So you, you can never really tell. So if you, if you go to the assumption that all people have equal intelligence, um, now, they use God. I'm happy with God, but I'm also happy not to use God. Every human has received, received, and I would get from God in brackets, the faculty of being able to instruct themselves. That's from Ranciere setting out Jack and Joe's principles. And that we can teach what we don't know. And then there's this fourth one that's very interesting, and it goes back to Dante's Inferno, right? That everything is in everything. You know, you give yourself the task of reading something that's really difficult, you don't know, and you don't really want to read. And all of a sudden, what you get from that are certain skills where, you know, it opens up and what you've learned there can be applied elsewhere. So, you know, or to go back to the skills you learn in, in uh, you know, martial arts, right? Like the discipline and skills can be then translocated in you know, um, university reading and, and writing papers easily enough, right? Yeah. Um, they mentioned in the book that um, the first word of the text they were reading was Calypso. Calypso, yeah. And then he says, um, everything is in Calypso. And then he breaks. Is this meant to be like some 
crazy theoretical thing, because if, if, if he's not genuine, then why not just have a single word in the whole book and just be both of them? That's a great question, and it's clever, too. Um, did you get an answer for that? Yeah. That would be, I, was, I got one, but I think it was going to be better. I could be wrong, but I think it's because that word was written by a person who has knowledge and you as a human being who has equal intelligence to that person, you then understand or have the ability to understand what is meant in that word. Okay, that's uh, that's complex. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and, and cool, yeah. Uh, Madeline, what do you got? I thought it was just, it just it was like, I think it was Palestine, it's already highlighted when you spoke that everything is everything. I was like, what does that mean? And I kind of like, I think I extended this to my synopsis too. I kind of wrote, like, I thought that it meant how he's saying that, like, a percentage of intelligence and understanding is making connections. Yeah. So that that thing you said, like, the finger of that mother, uh, the word under the mother's finger, yeah. this father is also Calypso. And it's like, because you can understand or make connections, you can understand any text. So it could be any woman dance. So I don't think it's a hidden code. Yeah, it's not about Calypso. Well, we still have, like, we have an explicator talking about how people shouldn't explicate. <laughs> and who's that? Rancière? Me? Yeah, Rancière. Yeah, he's trying not to. The real problem, he's, again, that's a, a good, good observation. Um, and you're not wrong. I mean, he's really trying not to. But then you get into, okay, anybody who writes a book is probably doing, you know, so Rancière's. They write these awful books about how the individual is everything, but they tell you a whole other script about the individual. I mean, it's just what happens when you write a personal philosophy. It's like, yeah, it's hard to be totally you're all people, right? So like, he's trying really hard not to be an explicator, and he's trying really hard to get across this really crucial point, or two crucial points, that we have equal intelligence and it gets taken away from us, that we can instruct ourselves, and that once we learn one thing, we can learn anything. So once we learn, so I don't know, I mean, maybe you could find some hidden meaning in Calypso. I was trying to think, I mean, the answers are, are good on this. I, was, I think any word can work. Um, it's a repetition of it to go back in the text, and then you start recognizing other words. So you start doing sight reading, and then you start recognizing how to make letters and all this stuff. Are you good if he's being literal, or if it's more of something theoretical? I guess uh, it's theoretical. So if it was theoretical, what would it be with Calypso? Uh, well, like you said, like, in a, in words, you can find some sort of truth, but not maybe not just Calypso. Maybe I would, word or yeah, it could be. You know, I think of like what was the, I don't know what your first reading words were. That we we started with the Dick James Block, like that group, right? Which have and they obviously because no one's like what? Okay, but that particular crew which have no sort of record, but you you start recognizing those repetition of the words, right? So. I would, interesting that, the question's interesting because I'd probably start with words rather than nouns. Um, but I guess they wanted to go with the first word in the text, you know. So then you, the, I thought maybe where you were going is, okay, so then you ask yourself a couple of questions. What's the first word in text you read? And how, are, are they significant? And this one I think Calypso was, because that was the name of the main character, right? Um, the other thing is if you're a Straussian political theorist, if anybody, and if you know what Neil Strauss's work, they have this, they have this really bad, I mean, they're really good political theorists, it's just their politics are bad. So, but they had this idea that there was a, the overt text and then there was the hidden text. And then the hidden text, if you really, if you really wanted to find the meaning of the text, you go to the very middle page. So I, of the text. And then you go, okay, well, if it's in translation, that gets a bit tricky, right? But, so I don't think Rancière and, and Jacquette were doing something like that with Calypso. I think they're just saying, take the first word that you see and see where it turns up again. Um, yeah. Yeah, for me, like two things. I, I, he makes an important distinction to not be an explicator by like, say, stating that like, books and material itself is separate from somebody like auditorily explaining it to you. He argues that like engaging with text material is just a transfer of thought and not necessarily in, like imposing thought as an explicator of the text. And then the second thing, I honestly viewed it as just like everything is in everything, as in that like as soon as you have the first axiom or like the first basic like block, if you will, of something, you can build it to literally yeah. anything. You I start with the word and then go on to math. Yeah, or even if you're doing math formulas, yeah. you can do that. Because I mean, I had a tutor who wrote math, right? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, what I learned there, okay, so, you know, 
I'm still not very good at like advanced math and, and geometry and all that. But I did learn the skills of how to do certain things that you carry over into other things. So I think that's, now who else had their hand up? Anybody? Yeah. I was thinking maybe in one way more so like, they, well they used to tell about these like this like three classes in order to be stable and everything and stuff. And also, so, so in Italy you talk about Greek languages and stuff and like call them back to Latin. And since that's such like a essential part of like Western education, especially at the time, to understand Greek, to understand Latin, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're like at the prompts or whatever. To use Calypso in order to have these kids translate the French from the original Greek and then also be able to understand it. Calypso in that way could be a symbol of just the old hierarchy of like, for these Flemish kids, they can still understand it. So the value of Calypso is that anyone can understand Greek unless you called up this like classic literary character yes. in the Odyssey that everyone knows and then you can read the Odyssey in the original Greek Latin and you're like, oh great. But these Flemish kids can do these things. It's kind of like, I think the age group more than just, just trying to cheese Calypso, which kind of like the symbolic thing or like the value of Does that, does that answer the point that you were, like they did, it is a classic text and it's a version of the classic text, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Yeah, no, it's not like Yeah, no, it's a version like, of that, yeah. You mentioned that it could be any word, not just close up. I think so, and he does right. say that, yeah. Well, so you must have a broader meaning, so it, maybe it's any word could substitute for close up. Yeah. Or, okay, we can go with that, or just learn any word and then see where it right. reappears yeah. again. I mean, you can keep it simple, too. And see where it appeals again, and then see, you know, kind of go that way. So I think you can do both the more a simpler meaning, uh, which is what I've always got from from Anzieder, and you can do a, a more, you know, sophisticated meaning. Certainly, when they were doing it, they probably weren't doing the sophisticated meaning. But that's not to say when Anzieder is writing it, he's not going for that too, because he's tricky. You know, he's a, a pretty a, a pretty profound thinker. So let me just check the time because. Oh, we're good. We'll go to about 1, 110, and then I should have it done. So again, just to go back to these, these are really contentious. I mean, they may not be contentious for us, that all people have equal intelligence, that we can instruct ourselves, we can teach what we don't know, and everything is in everything. But they were very contentious, and they were very contentious in the 1980s in the French educational system. Yes? That is an interesting question. Later on in the assigned reading, he used the term rational man or human. Yes. And that is a requirement to have equal intelligence. So what does he mean by a rational human man? I think where he's using it towards the end of chapter three, yeah. I think, yeah, he's saying that, okay, so I think he's trying to say two things. The rational person yeah. is the code word for people that are included and able to make, if you read Locke, and if you read, um, political thought, or theory, Locke, Hobbes, Rousseau, right? Um, Marx is rational animal, that we have the capacity for rational thought. That gets coded into who then can make decisions, right? So then you get into actual constitutions of who's considered rational and who's not. Yeah. He's trying to respond to that, okay? So when he's writing in the 1830s, you've got property owners as rational, most, I would say males, who are property owners. Then there's also, you know, the, the French Revolution and then the 1830s the, uh, and the uh, Commune, but you've got the fight for lowering that to standards of the organized working class, right? So you've got that going on as who's rational. So rational, as you point out, is like a really contested category and what, what Jack is trying to show is we're all rational, we all have the same ability, intellectual capability. You know, so you remember, like, you know, there's a list of who's not rational. They include women and people that yeah. they, they go through that, and then the category keeps changing. Right? Um, so yeah, that's a good, good point. Yes. So do I understand that there is um, our intellectual capabilities or capacities are equal? Yes. But when it comes to actual intelligence, there is a hierarchy. Yeah, it gets tricky, and I have trouble with this too. So look, he's trying to say, and I'm going to keep it simple because. He's, he's trying to say that we all start out with equal intellectual capacity. Capacity, capacity sorry, capacity is good. We all start, but where we end up being in born in society, where we end up learning, what ends up happening, the social construction around us, then it starts accounting for difference. Now people have argued against that and say, hey, no, 
we don't all start out with equal intellectual, you know, uh, equal intelligence. But if you keep it as like we all start out with rationality, equal intelligence, and then look, if you're born to a poor family where your parents don't know how to read and write, he's giving you real hope that you, and, and certainly people do, um, can learn this and learn the skills and go on. But if you're born to like a professional, 1830s professional family lawyer where you've got all this, it, it's just so much easier, right? And so he, he's trying to say that we have equal intelligence and basically society is going to take that away from us. I think where he's going, but yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify, like on a broader argument basis, he's pretty much just critiquing the Enlightenment. Elitism. Yes, <laughs> that's good. Okay, thanks for that. Yes, he is, and that's why we're starting out with it. And then we're going to Kant, who again, Kant was this great thing in, in um, what is enlightenment, where I think it's that one, which we're doing after we do what I'm seeing, who says basically, you know, it's us that keeps ourselves immature, okay, by not learning and stuff, right? So he's taking the best part of Kant and going with that. So that's, so that's part of the influence of Kant there, yeah. Yeah, it's good. And it's like sort of, so if we start off here and then we go to the Enlightenment, it kind of gives a different, a different read on it. So then, you know, universal teaching, we've gone through that. The person not yet knowing will learn by herself what the master doesn't know if the master believes she can and obliges her to realize these capabilities. Now, there's nothing worse. I don't know if you've had this experience. Then working with somebody who doesn't want you to know more than them. Right? Because they're just going to, like, I don't know if you have bosses like this or you work with people like this, because they're just going to keep, like, they, they just have a lot of, like, in, what would you call it? Fear. Fear embedded in making sure that you don't know more than them. You know, and, and one of the things that Jacoteau didn't have, and, and so Rancier is using that to critique the French professoriate at the time, too, because they want to keep the students not, you know, the students, the, the 60s and 80s was very radical for students wanting to restructure education. Um, you've got this great Lacan, I don't know if you've seen this on YouTube, but we're doing some Lacan, I might play it for you, where the student comes up and Lacan's lecturing, the student comes up and throws a pitcher of water on Lacan, because Lacan is like, you can be your own master, all you're doing is replacing one master with another, so the student comes up, throws his pitcher of water on Lacan, and Lacan is actually really cool about it, right? He's like, you know, okay, that may not be the way of like being your own master, right? But the thing is, you know, so he doesn't freak out or anything. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So in that stance, he's saying that what we tend to do is replace one master with another master. And what Rancière is part of that whole group, too, he's a little bit later, and he's saying, well, we don't want to do that. We want people to be able to learn, teach, and understand for themselves. So when you've got this circle of power that's closed, it's similar to the old method. But what Ranzier argues is that it's a new circle of power because you can break out of it, and you can break out of it because you can take what you learn and you can apply it elsewhere. He says that what happens in this, the old circle of power is that there's this real sort of circle of powerlessness hidden in the social structure. Whereas the circle of power can only take effect by being made public. Now, if you go to page 18, and the PDF has the same page numbers on it, and then we'll go to slide seven. Um, if you, page 18 kind of sums up chapter one. And if you go to the, like the seventh line there, whoever teaches without emancipating stultifies. And whoever emancipates doesn't have to worry about what the emancipated person learns. He will learn what he wants, nothing maybe. He will know what he can learn because he has the same, because the same intelligence is at work in all the productions of the human mind. And a human can always understand another human's words. And then if you go down to the second last paragraph, he talks about Ranciere there, and he says, that he proclaimed, Jacoteau proclaimed, sorry, Ranci, Ranciere talks about Jacoteau. He proclaimed that one could teach what one didn't know, and that a poor, ignorant father could teach if he was emancipated, conduct the education of his children, and he says mother at another time, without the aid of any master explicator. 
And he indicated that the way of that universal teaching is, quote, and it's in the italics, to learn something and to relate it to all the rest by the principle, all men, all humans have equal intelligence. So it's like universal teaching, which is what we do naturally. So he says that the student's method is actually the natural method. It's universal teaching, and that is to learn something and relate it to the rest by this principle. All humans have equal intelligence. And he says it's the disciple that makes the master. It's not the master that makes the disciple. He turns it around. And he's got a double play. To go back to your question on Calypso, on this one there is a double play. On the one hand, um, if you are an emancipated learner and teacher, you're not going to make somebody your master, right? Um, but in order to have an ignorant master, the disciple, so the disciple then learns from the ignorant master. So there's kind of a double play on that. So what's really the radical insight here that's revealed to Jacato by simply doing that Ben Ranciere picks up from historical documents is this that we tend to take more for granted now, and that is that it was earth-shaking at the time. That's the other thing that I'm sure you know if you've done political theory courses. You know, when you're reading material, you're like, well, yeah. Okay, it's well, yeah, now. But it wasn't well, yeah, when it was written. And I think that one of, like, <clears throat> it's important to keep that in mind because there's a lot of stuff that, once it becomes common knowledge, isn't seen as radical. But before it becomes common knowledge, it was extremely, extremely radical. So the radical insight that is why Ranciere is using Jacato, and, and really because Ranciere is a very strong believer in like equality and democracy, that all intelligences are equal. That's on page 27. And following from Jacato's conclusion that all students can teach themselves, he contends that it's possible to declare from experience that all intelligences are equal. So if you just go to page 27, I would mark that off in case you're doing some work with the text where he says, middle paragraph there, that there aren't halfway, it's, it's a paragraph that starts, here everything that is in Calypso. And he says, there aren't two sorts of minds. There's inequality in the manifestations of intelligence according to the greater, greater or lesser energy communicated to intelligence by the will for discovering and combining new relations. But there's no hierarchy of intellectual capacity. What I would add to that is, you know, if will is energy, and we'll get to that, and attention, some people are in situations where they can spend more energy and attention. And we'll pick that up in a second. He also says that if a child, to go back to Calypso, is intelligent enough to teach themselves to speak through observing, imitation, practice, then a child is intelligent enough to teach themselves to read. And if you can then read, you can learn anything. So it's very simple. He, he kind of takes it as a sort of very simple method. He says that if a child is intelligent enough to teach themselves to speak, in the language they're born into, through observation, imitation, practice. Then a child's intelligent enough to teach themselves to read. And if they can teach themselves to read, they can learn anything. So since most humans are able to speak and understand the language, it's possible to presume that all intelligence are equal. So this inequality among intelligences, he suggests, can result from the explicative order of schools and universities, rote memory, having to have the right answer, having to do it a certain way, also having to be in a certain type of classroom, um, rather than from any innate hierarchy of intelligence. So, you know, some people have it. 
I'm fortunate in a way I can sit for a long time. I've got really close to it. But um, I've got really solid concentration. I always have had. Um, one of the students years ago, he's doing his PhD now, um, he really, he, he turned out to be really great. He hadn't filmed um, on location and stuff for his, to match his essay. He filmed in India, um, and he was filming, um, filming something in a particular village. Uh, but he really did not sit still. I mean, like, he was just like, he's great because he always called me Miss. He still calls me Miss ever since. But he's great. He's like, this, I just, I know, I can't sit still. So I was like, well, uh, we had a really cool roommate. But I was like, just move around. So he would like move around. And, you know, he, he turned out like understanding the material like extremely well because he wasn't forced, you know, because. And he went on, he did his MA, he's doing his PhD. Um, he still can't really sit still, but it hasn't been a, a detriment. So in that sense, it, one of the things that the, the students were, were arguing against and fighting for in France in the 80s was a different form of education. Foucault was, was part of that as well. And in inequality and intelligences can result from like not being able to fit into the old, outdated teaching model. You know, the old order, the old master, they explain a book to the students, um, there's right answers, somebody's set up as a teacher, and then you have to understand the complexity of the text, and the students are put into those with less intelligence. They learn to repeat the master's explanation. Um, in a sense, then, the old style master positions the students in stages of ignorance, is what Rancio is saying. And you end up, page 21, with fragments of knowledge. As we said before, with the teacher always keeping a piece of learning um, for themselves, right? It's their power. So the first principle in universal teaching, one must learn something and relate everything else to it. And the, as part of that, it is take it and read it. Like, take it and read it. So, you know, okay, even if you don't sort of like it, it's or take it and engage with it. So if you go to page 22, he's talking about the poor person at the bottom. He says, take it and read it, he says to the poor person. I don't know how to read answers the person. How would I understand what is written in books? As you've understood all things up to now, by comparing two facts, Here's what I will tell you, the first sentence of the book. Calypso could not be consoled after the departure of Ulysses. Repeat Calypso, Calypso could. Um, and then you go down, the first word I said to you was Calypso. Wouldn't that also be the first word on the page? And then you kind of look closely and pick it out of other words and you learn from there. Or another example he was giving was, um, I can't remember what kind of trades person it was, but they saw the L to describe the alphabetical letters. He saw the L as a box, but they saw them as, as characters, right? And he saw something else, I can't remember which one it was, as a different character, and then he could pick those out. Or the, there was also the example of teaching a lithographer what he thought he was learning was Hebrew, but he actually wasn't learning Hebrew. He was learning the skills of like doing characters and things like that, right? So. It's the idea of, of take it and read it, or take it and do it. Not to be confused, of course. I don't know, I'm a big fan of just doing it. Okay. Um, compare and compare and always respond to this three-part question, this third part of the method. What do you see? So you can learn by comparing with your thing. What do you see? What do you think about what you make of it? And that's on page 20. The circle of power forbids cheating, particularly the great cheat. Okay, so this is the great cheat, and anytime you find yourself doing this, and we all find ourselves doing this, right? The great cheat is, it's a great cheat in old learning, incapacity, I can't and I don't understand. You know, I mean, I probably do it much less now because I know that when I first, oh my god, the most 
Okay, so like you can apply the same to wall climbing. Okay, so somebody bought me a Prezi of wall climbing. It's like a wall climbing. Um, and I don't know what your learning, what your learning skills are like, but at first when anything new comes, I just don't get it. Right? Like I just don't get it. I'm like, it's you know, but then eventually I get it. And you know, at this at this stage, I know I'm gonna get it. It's just a matter of eventually, right? And of course, everybody, I mean, it was great. The, the person I was working with was awesome, and I did make it to the top, but only on the easy one. But there's this first thing, it doesn't matter how old you get, there's this first thing where you go, I can't, I don't understand. You go, hey, wait a minute. Like, I've been there so many different times in so many different areas, whether it's like driving, reading a text, like all these different areas, right? Doing a new job, all that. And you always can, but it's, what happens is, is, until you get that sort of history of going, I can't, I don't understand, and then going, yeah, well, like, I've been here before. Uh, many times, until you get that sort of history of something mentioned at the beginning of confidence, you just kind of go and do it, you're gonna get stuck there. So what, what Rancier was is saying, that the biggest incapacity is this idea of, I don't understand. And that's the foundation of old learning. It's learning that's premised on the principle of inequality, the old principle. Now, of course, in the wall, in the wall climbing, um, or rock climbing, wall climbing, on the, so, of course, they do check to make sure you got your harness on, right? You know, like that's kind of important. Um, but you have to learn how to do it yourself, and then you get like wrong a few times and all that. So, eventually, this, this learning premise on the principle of inequality, the old principle, keeps you at this point of like, I can't, I don't understand. So the principle of equality, on the other hand, what, what then Ranzier calls the Jack the Toe principle, emancipates regardless of the procedure, of the book, or the fact it's applied to. So what it does is it reveals intelligence to itself. What the Jacques Rateau principle, the intellectual emancipation principle does, is reveal an intelligence to itself. And anything can be used. That there's no hierarchy of intellectual capacity, anything can be used to reveal an intelligence to itself. Now for me, this is kind of where it gets really interesting. Um, and that is we've got so you've got the student's method, which is you interrogate in order to be instructed. Now the master or the teacher can do this too. It gets really interesting for me when I'm in the teaching position because there's a claim that the learned master makes it very difficult for the master not to spoil the method. So if you know the answer, then you have a tendency to lead someone towards that answer, right? That's the correct, that's the Socratic method. That you ask students questions to get a predetermined answer. Um, and I try really hard not to do that. I really try to only ask questions I don't know the answers to. And it's surprising what you could not know the answers to. I mean, I think what you would know at my stage of, of teaching is either the answers or where to go to get the answers but you may not have the set answer. So you don't ask people answers to get to a predetermined, or questions to get to a predetermined answer. The old teachers that he's critiquing, the church, the hierarchy of um, university professors at the time, guide the students' intelligence. But they, they do it discreetly perhaps, but they don't leave it to itself. It's a Socratic method of interrogation to get to the truth where there's a path to learning, but not a path to emancipation. So remember, Socrates asks Nino you know, all these questions to draw out what he knows he knows already. Ranzier argues that the Socratic method of guided interrogation, that's question and answer, is a form of stultification. So the student method, is interrogate in order to be instructed, not to instruct. He says, this is the student's method. You're not interrogating. I had a friend who's studying a lot of Plato, and she teaches Plato. She has done for a long time. 
She used to always, always use the Socratic method. And she used it like extremely well. And, but she was always going for winning an argument, right? So it was just, and she kind of brought out, and she often did, but she kind of brought out like sort of the worst examples of that because it's like she would only ask questions where she knew the answers that were guided questions to get to her point. And that, and what Ramsey is saying is that that's the Socratic method. The subduing method is interrogate in order to be instructed, not to instruct. And he says that this can only really be informed by someone who knows no more than the student. That is what he's calling the ignorant, ignorant master. And so to teach, to teach what one doesn't know is simply to ask questions about what one doesn't know. What inhibits the poor, ignorant, and these are in quotation marks, but that's the poor, ignorant, common person of the 1830s is not lack of instruction. What really inhibits people then and today is this belief in the inferiority of intelligence and the inferiority of their intelligence. So universal teaching is a universal verification of the similarity of what all the emancipated can do. That's reason between equals. We've seen children and adults, Ramsey says, learn by themselves without anybody <coughs> explaining it to them. They've learned how to read, they've learned how to write, they've learned how to play music, they've learned how to paint, um, they've learned how to speak foreign languages. These are facts, Ramsey says, and the facts can be explained by the equality of intelligence or the equality of intelligences applied to different areas. So this universal teaching is everything is in everything. All power of language is in the totality of a book. And then he would say, like, master yourself by mastering a word, a sentence, a chapter, a book. So the question then is, then he says, okay, so why is it, you know, one person succeeds in learning in life and another doesn't? If in the first moments of life we have the same intelligence, so what produces difference? Well, his answer to that, oh, sorry, that's just from the previous one. That what stultifies the common person is the belief in the inferiority of their intelligence. What, what produces difference is what he calls attention. So attention is what makes the difference between those who learn and those who don't. And by attention, he means attention of will. He says, okay, intelligence is attention. And the mind, this is very Nietzsche, actually. I mean, Nietzsche's will to power, in a sense, is sort of energy, right? So you can see where Nietzsche, if we were doing thus book that history, you can see where Nietzsche would, would come in here. So attention and will, what he means by attention is, you know, this idea that the mind is activity, and the will is the power to act, and will is energy. And that greater or lesser of energy is used. And then he says, sounding very Nietzsche-like, human beings are a will served by an intelligence. That that all will is is, is um, <coughs> the power to act. That it's energy, we expand greater or lesser of energy being used, that we are a will served by intelligence, but but Attention really is what makes the difference between those who learn and those who don't anything specific. And once you've learned one thing, of course, you can apply that attention, you know, to tying knots with wall climbing, for example. So greater or lesser energy committed, that's what will is for Ranciere. And that's the method, is, is the student's method. So Ranciere points out that it's useless to engage in this nature-nurture debate which attempts to determine where lesser intelligence, or whether lesser intelligence is the cause, is caused by society, or is caused by, by nature. He suggests that people develop the intelligence that the needs and the circumstances of existence demand of them. That if we're a will served by intelligence, then 
differences in intelligences have to do with differences in attention. That is, the mind is activity and the will, the power to act. Now, if you want to follow this up, and I'd like to take you to these pages, because we're almost done, we need about five minutes more, I think. Um, if you want to go to page 50, if you take a look, he will say, he says at the bottom there, the last paragraph, just before the very last line, he will say, I will not say that he has done less well because he's less intelligent. I will say that he's perhaps produced a poorer work because he has worked more poorly and that he has not seen well because he hasn't looked well. I would say that he brought less attention to his work. And then the top of 51, he says, attention is neither the skull surrounding the brain nor an occult quality. It's an immaterial fact in its principle, material in its effects. We have thousands of ways of verifying its presence, its absence, its greater intensity. Um, for the man is the will served by an intelligence. That's the bottom of 51 to 52. And then if you go over uh, to 50, um, if you go over to 54, because he says, okay, then he proposes, he says, what is the mind's original sin? Well, the mind's original sin is not haste, but distraction, absence. And then we think, okay, you know, I don't know about you, but I can work pretty well with distraction. I think one of the things that we've developed is this in, in our ability to multitask, um, is that we can work with distraction and attention simultaneously. So you can be actually doing something with extreme attention and have distractions going on over here and work just as well as anybody who didn't have distractions going on. So I mean, that's what Rancière is saying coming out of Jacato. I think that because we're working a lot on screens, et cetera, we've got something different going on with attention and distraction. And I think that becomes, that becomes really important. Um, so how do you teach what you don't know? Well, you've got to be emancipated. And by being emancipated, that doesn't mean, it means you don't say, this is the way it has to be done. This is the answer. You ask questions about what you don't know. You open the space for others to learn. And you actively believe in the equality of intelligence. Even if, you're in a situation, and this becomes difficult, where the other person or persons are not manifesting their intelligence, right? So I think, I think you can believe, actively believe in the equality of intelligence and realize that perhaps the others are not giving it the attention that is necessary, right? And then, Universal teaching verifies that the similarity of all of what all emancipated can do. That's learn by yourself and also become a you can kind of learn this through the society of the emancipated. And there he goes, like Nietzsche to the arts, to minds, that's on page 65, to minds in action, people who do, who speak about what they're doing. And he says that that really the virtue of our intelligence is less on knowing than in doing. Knowing is nothing. Doing is everything. That's on page 65. That if you take a look at minds in action, people who do who speak about what they're doing, knowing, he says, is nothing, but doing is everything. So equality and intelligence for Rancière and Jacato are synonymous terms. And what he argues, this is where it goes from being individual and being individualist to being collective, and that is that the equality of intelligence is the common bond of humankind. And he ends chapter three with that quote. So when he looks at the community of equals, he says that the last page 73, that the equality of intelligence is the common bond of human beings, the society necessary for the society to exist, and he's going to pick that up in the next the next two um, lessons. 
So we are done at 102. Um, take, yeah, take a 15 minute break. So we'll be back at 120. That's a little bit more. For the people that don't have their presentations, come and see me and you can pick them out of the bag. And I'll turn this off.